Ladies and gentlemen, if you are able, please stand. Please be seated. Good morning, and a warm welcome to Sanderstead United Reformed Church for this service of thanksgiving and celebration for the life of George Fosco. As you know, these are strange times we live in, and uh, I have to give you some housekeeping regulations before we actually start the service. Um, you will have signed a, a piece of paper when you come in with the do's and don'ts, just to remind you that uh, if you please remain seated after the service and the stewards will tell you when to leave. Um, there is a, another beatitude which is not recorded in the Gospels. It's, it's blessed are those who turn off their mobile phones for they shall not be embarrassed when they go off. <laughs> but I've got to actually ask you please to turn off your mobile phones and I don't mean put on silent to turn off because our technical people tell us that this could interfere with the data downstream uh, so if you have them turned off rather than just silent, that would be extremely helpful. And um, for the benefit of anybody who might be in the hall, uh, there is actually a 30 second delay in the streaming. So what we see in here will be heard in the hall 30 seconds later. Um, and also just to say there is a book of condolences at the back of the church and Brenda and family would be very uh, pleased if you could put your name and some memories of George in the Book of Condolences. Thank you very much. And now, let us worship God. Let us hear some words from the Book of the Prophet Isaiah. These words were written probably some 700 years before the time of Jesus, but they look forward to a time when God would enter time and space, human history, to overcome the power of death. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. I, unlike I think most of you here, did not have the privilege of knowing George, which is my loss, because what I've heard from Brenda and members of the congregation, he would have been a great person to have known. So it's my loss, and I'm sure your joy and privilege to have known a man like George, a man renowned for his humour, his compassion, his kindness, his good fellowship, a man 
after many peoples and perhaps, I think, to God's own heart. Robert Louis Stevenson is a famous writer and uh, among the writings he left behind, he left a, a kind of eulogy to an unknown friend whom he knew in Edinburgh. I don't know who this person was, but I think when you hear me read it, he could have been talking about someone very much like George. Stevenson writes, that person is a success who has lived well and laughed often and loved much, who has gained the respect of his fellow men and women and the love of children, who has filled their niche and accomplished their task, who has left the world better than they found it, who has never lacked appreciation of the earth's beauty or failed to express it, who has always looked for the best in others and gave the best they had, whose life was an inspiration, whose memory a blessing. Obviously, this is a time to give thanks and to celebrate uh, George's life, and it will be in that spirit of thanksgiving, but it's also a time when we mourn his passing and remember all that he was to so many people, how he touched so many lives and enhanced so many lives. We're here also to pray for God's comfort. Comfort. Now that, to me, is a lovely word, comfort. The English word is based on two Latin words, cum forte, which means to make strong together. So as we come together in this service to worship God and to give thanks for George, may we comfort each other. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord of life and conqueror of death, you are our help in every time of trouble. In the presence of death, you comfort those who mourn. We come before you, believing you bear our grief and share our sense of loss. Give us grace to worship you and to trust in your goodness and mercy. Assure us that because Christ lives, we also shall live. God of grace and love, as we give thanks for the life of George Foster, send your Holy Spirit among us that we may hear your promises and know them to be true and so receive the comfort and the peace they bring through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn and all the hymns have been favourites of George and uh, our opening hymn, which unfortunately, again, because of the rules, we can't stand and sing, so I ask the congregation to remain seated while the choir sing, Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided.
Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you did not make us for darkness and death, but for life with you forever. Without you, we have nothing to hope for. With you, we have nothing to fear. Speak to us now your words of eternal life from Scripture. Lift us from any anxiety and sorrow to the light and peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. We now come to our scripture reading from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. And to put this reading in context, these are words that Jesus spoke to his disciples, his closest friends, the night before his own death on the cross. And Jesus realised what lay before him. And he wished to bring comfort and assurance to those closest to him. And these words have brought comfort and assurance to countless people through the generations. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and I shall come back and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. I shall not leave you sorrowing. I am coming back to you. In a little while the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Peace is my gift to you, my own peace, such as this world cannot give. Let not your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Amen. We continue our worship now as we sing another of George's favourite hymns, The Lord is my shepherd, I'll not want, to the famous tune, Crimin.
Thank you. As I said, I didn't have the privilege of knowing George. But we're going to hear about George's life now from two people who knew him extremely well, his sons, Jeremy and Nigel. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on my father and the environment in which he was brought up in, uh, and then talk a little bit about the man. So it's quite an interesting story. Born in Ipswich in 1931, I think the average ex age expectancy in those days was not quite the grand old age he reached. Uh, anyway, in the height of the Depression, and his brother, younger brother Douglas, arrived two years later. Ipswich was quite a small town in those days. He had a glorious time growing up, freedom to roam in the fields and parks, plenty of streams and ponds, full of aquatic life, fish, plants, and as he said, we never locked the front door, we never locked the windows, didn't need to. So it's a very different world. The war changed things. Bearing in mind where Ipswich was, it was on the east coast. Uh, there were minesweepers, obviously British ones, stationed in the docks there. Um, and they were a target, of course, for the German Air Force. And aerial bombings were a regular occurrence. So while Dad, his brother and his friends enjoyed the evening fireworks and collecting bits and pieces from airplanes that came down, such as unexploded bombs, hand grenades, bullets, all sorts of things that uh, you know, really they shouldn't have been collecting but did. Anyway, my grandparents were somewhat less amused and as a result the family moved six miles outside of town to uh, Grandad's sister where there was peace, quiet, easy access to pheasant, rabbit and so on. Food rationing, not a problem for my dad. <laughs> After eight months, the air raid stopped and the family moved back to Ipswich and at this point dad, who was ten, went into the local post office and the postmaster said, my goodness, what have they been feeding you? He was nearly six foot tall. So for those of you that knew him, he was a tall guy. Yeah. Uh, and for those that don't know, Dad had two great uncles. They were twins and both of them were seven foot six. Wow, yes. They're called the Suffolk Giants and there is a, uh, they're buried somewhere, I can't remember where, but... Uh, and funnily enough, I remember my grandparents, my dad's dad was actually quite a little fella. My dad's mum, she was a big lady, big lady. Anyway, on returning home, despite the break in schooling, he passes 11 plus, attended a local grammar school, and his grandmother bought him a brand new rally bike, complete with dynamo as a reward for getting in. But apparently grammar school, don't forget he'd missed a little bit of education, it was a big step up from his primary school. Struggled a little, but he came through in the end, passed his equivalent of O-levels. Um, and unfortunately, unlike most of, us, most of us who were very lucky and able to go to university, finances at home meant he had to leave school at this point. Um, although he could easily have completed his last year and gone to university, but had he done that, very unlikely he would have met mum for the reasons I'm going to explain to you. So from 1948 to 1951, he worked for a company called, and who could make this up? The Gas, Light and Coke Company. Anyway, they became North Thames Gas, so slightly more familiar ring. And he worked in their research laboratories in Fulham, moved in with his grandparents who lived that way, uh, and at the same time started evening school at Chelsea Polytechnic for his uh, intermediate Bachelor of Science, and he passed that in 1950. Now, because he passed National Service, which was deferred, it stopped, and he was called up. So after basic training as a technical assistant in the Royal Artillery, he was sent to Beaconsfield, he became an educational instructor. The training, he did it in two months. And he typically, apparently, to become a sergeant instructor takes 12 years. So it does give you an idea as to, you know, he was quite a sharp guy. Uh, after which, despite requesting, please keep me in the UK so I can continue my studies, he was sent to Singapore and Malaya uh, with the Signals Regiment, which were part of the Air Force. 
He did that for two years. Once back from national service, he rejoined North Thames Gas and he started again at evening school his Bachelor of Science in Special Chemistry at Battersea College of Technology. And in 1960, obtained his degree. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Meanwhile, in 1959, dissatisfied with working for North Thames Gas, he joined Beecham's and he stayed there, uh, now called Smith Klein Beecham's, and he stayed there till 1980. He said he was very, very lucky to join Beecham's at that time. My brother will talk a little bit about, more about the work he did, but we have to take our hat off to him and recognise a person whose work in penicillins not only provided him with great job satisfaction, but saved countless lives and aided the suffering from infection of millions of people. In 1961, Mum and Dad got married. He met Mum on the ice rink at Queensway, I think that's right, isn't it, Queensway, while they were both students at Battersea. And his favourite trick, skating around the ice rink as fast as possible and then stopping quickly like this, showering ice onto the bare legs of the ladies and the girls skating. Much to his amusement, but not theirs, although clearly he managed to impress one of them. So, and initially the family home was in Horsham in Sussex. I was, we stayed there till I was 10, I just about remember it. Nige, you were zero, I don't think you probably remember it at all. Wendy was about eight, so probably remembers it a bit. Uh, and in 1973, we moved to our house in Sanderstead in West Hill to obtain, very lucky, better schooling for us children. And mum and dad joined this church um, in 19, uh, and in, he, dad taught in the junior church here and in 1980, I believe, was elected an elder. I'm looking around, people are nodding. And he be, also became a manager here. So during his life, uh, and I'm pleased to see, I mean, thank you to the Bowls Club, it was very, very kind of you for the, you know, for the little uh, honour as we came in. But he's made and met many, many friends in his hobbies of bridge, bowls, uh, masonry, philately and walking. In fact, he belonged to two bridge clubs and for many years he taught bridge at the Croydon Adult Education Centre. So my dad had many attributes. Uh, and for those of you that know him or knew him, you will agree with this, I'm sure. He had high moral values, a great sense of what was fair, and he was caring and had empathy. Uh, and I got this story from one of my cousins. So Nick, one of my cousins, younger cousins, he, his brother and his sister, unfortunately lost their mother at a very, very early age in their lives. And in fact, I remember them staying with us for a little while during that time. Nick's father was a businessman incredibly busy running his own business uh, and he didn't, he didn't really know what to do and he certainly didn't have the time to look after three young kids full time. Nick told me um, that there was talk of putting them into care, boarding school or something like that. My dad apparently said to mum, I don't know if this is true, but my dad said to my mum, because he said this to Nick, no way, no way are those children going into care, we will look after them. We haven't got a big house, but we'll find the room, we'll find a way to look after them. And although that didn't need to happen in the end, Nick told me that that is how he remembered my father, a caring man full of charity. So as you will have heard, Dad enjoyed giving to society. You can appreciate that from the work that he did, the hobbies that he had, and at the same time he had a great gift of trying to make people laugh. Although, believe me, I lived with him, most of his jokes were terrible <laughs> and more likely to elicit groans rather than laughter. But nonetheless, allow me to give you a couple of snippet, snippets. This, this particular one came, came on later in life, shall we say, uh, and he called it God's plan for ageing. Most seniors do not get enough exercise. In his wisdom, God decreed that seniors should become forgetful so that they would have to search for their glasses, their keys and other things thus doing more walking. God looked down and saw that this was good. Then God saw that there was another need. In his wisdom, he made seniors lose coordination so they would drop things, requiring them to bend, reach, stretch. And again, he looked down and he saw that this was good. And then he considered the function of bladders and decided seniors needed more calls of nature, thus requiring more trips to the bathroom, again, providing more exercise. 
So if you find as you age, you're getting up and down more, it is all God's will and it is in your best interest. <laughs> Excuse me, must go to the bathroom. No, 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 just, jo <laughs> just joking. This is great. Men have two motivations, hunger and hanky-panky, and they can't tell them apart. So ladies, if you see a gleam in his eye, give him a sandwich. <laughs> and finally, his last words were, please, no tears, no fuss. I've had a great innings, thoroughly enjoyed my life. Very lucky to have a super wife who has helped me through thick and thin and have three children of which both of us are very proud. Thank you. And now uh, my brother would like to say a few words. Thank you, Jeremy, for that excellent tribute. Hopefully you can hear me, I'm a little bit taller. My dad, George Vosker, he grew roses and he kept a pond. He grew cacti and he kept rabbits. He lost those rabbits to foxes and then kept foxes <laughs> in the same rabbit pen that he'd built. Uh, I think that shows his compassion and warm-heartedness. Um, he believed in God and he believed in hard work. So as my brother said, he thrived in the army as an educational instructor, and that's a tough job. You have to be, you have to be pretty tough to face down, well, to enforce discipline in the army. He walked away from a commission there to get back to studying chemistry, and I know that he was very proud of his work he did at Beecham's. He advanced antibiotics, a lot, and I think we all know antibiotics are so very useful and have saved a lot of suffering. He led a team of nine scientists designing and purifying penicillins. Um, he saved his pharmaceutical company a fortune by avoiding the need for a catalyst made of palladium, and uh, he surely made amoxicillin a great deal cheaper than it would otherwise have been. Now. There were over 20 publications and patents from his work in chemical engineering, and don't worry, I'm not going to start sketching chemical diagrams and things, but uh, I'll be very brief, actually. My happiest memories of Dad are uh, the garden bonfires that we had when I was little, which is probably very standard, but th there it is. He loved a good bonfire. Um, lots of happy memories were here at this church too. Uh, but mum said to me that his happiest years were his retirement years. And dad would have jokingly asked, who told you that? And I'm sure most of us will remember his sense of humour. Um, and I'm going to leave you with just this one thing. He, Mum complained that he... Uh, He'd been growing these giant thistles next to the washing line and it was bothering her and I, I looked at them and they were at least seven foot tall. And that was funny straight away. Um, but the following year, they were back again. <laughs> so there was no accident. He deliberately cultivated giant cardoons right next to the washing line. Um, and yeah, and this is how I think we should remember him, we know, with a smile. And uh, that's all I'd have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. And Jeremy, I'm sure your father would be very proud of you. And you've done a great uh, service to his memory. And uh, I think all of us, especially people like me who didn't know him personally, all of us know him a little better now. And those of you who met him and knew him are uh, probably that much more appreciative of having met and knew him. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock. Amen. The, uh, a lot of George's life was spent during the Second World War, and uh, towards the end of the Second World War, one of its great leaders, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, died before final victory. And uh, for obvious reasons, his great friend and colleague Winston Churchill couldn't go to his funeral at that time. 
But after the war was over and Churchill was out of office, he went to Roosevelt's grave, where he was buried in, in his estate in New York, upstate New York. And as he stood beside Roosevelt's grave, he said in his inimitable style, he said, meeting Franklin Roosevelt was like opening your first bottle of champagne. Knowing him was like drinking it. And those of you who have met and known George, I'm sure can empathize with these sentiments. George was a man who, as I said, had evidently great humor, which is one quality in life I admire greatly, and I'm sure God admires too. But people tend to forget that God too has a sense of humor. He was a person of great kindness, great dedication, and it's wonderful to hear that countless lives have probably been saved by George's work. That's, I always find you pass somebody in the street, maybe you never knew them, but you don't realize just how much they have done for the, the cause of, of good in this world. And uh, George also was a junior church teacher, and there's probably countless young lives he f helped shape and form for the better. I don't know how, if George was a great traveler or not. Um, none of us have been great travelers in recent years because we haven't been able to go anywhere. But uh, just before lockdown, a year or so before lockdown, my wife and I went on a holiday of all places to Fair Isle. Now, Fair Isle, as you probably know, and if you don't know, it's no reflection in your geography, is <laughs> halfway between Shetlands and Or the Orkney Islands. And uh, there's very little there, but a lot of seabirds, and it's uh, worth going if you're interested in that sort of thing. But if you're interested in architecture, it's not the place to go. Because there are no buildings whatsoever of note, except two. And that's the lighthouses on the north side and the south side of the island. And they were built by the Stevenson family. The same Stevenson family of which Robert Louis Stevenson was a member. Only well, he was the black sheep, but he was a writer, the rest were all engineers. And... Uh, these lighthouses, which they built the best part of 200 years ago, are still shining today and casting their light across the waters, guiding ships away from danger. And you're probably asking, what's the point of this holiday reminiscence? Well, it's this. The Stevenson family built these lighthouses and most of the lighthouses around the rocky coast of Western Scotland. But the Stevenson family are no longer with us. But the light they created shines on. And so it is when we lose someone we love. Though they may be no longer with us themselves, the light that they shone into our lives and hearts and memories will never be put out. And I'm sure that as the days go on, these memories and blessings and thoughts will bring you comfort and good cheer as you remember George and all that he meant to you. I, I am a Scot, as you probably know, <laughs> heard or realised by hearing me talk, and uh, I come from the same part of Scotland as the great poet Robert Burns. I believe Burns suppers are a feature of the, of the, uh, the social life of this church, so I've not actually been to one yet, for, for, again, because of the dreaded COVID. But Burns wrote uh, an eight-line obituary for a friend of his father's who was a miller in a town called Terbolton in Ayrshire. And uh, I, these words came to mind as I was privileged to read Jeremy's uh, trilogy, uh, eulogy before, I, um, before the service. And Burns wrote of this man, William Muir, words that I think could be equally applied to George. An honest man, here lies at rest, as ere God with his image blessed, the friend of man, the friend of truth, the friend of age, the guide of youth. Few hearts like his with virtue warmed, few heads with knowledge so informed. If there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there is none, he made the best of this. Now, as a minister, you may not come as a great surprise to you to realize that I do believe that this earth is not all there is, that because of Christ's life, death and resurrection, there is something to look forward to. And I believe that because of the promises that Jesus made 
on that night, the ones I read earlier from John 14. Jesus made two promises that night. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I am coming back to you. And he did, because if he hadn't, these words would never have been recorded. If Christ had not risen that first Easter Sunday, this church would not be here. No word of the New Testament would have been written, and we would have no Christian faith, no Christian hope, and certainly no Christian ministers. But he did fulfill that promise. And one of the other great blessings in George's life was his long marriage to Brenda. And in that reading, Jesus actually uses the imagery of a Jewish wedding at his time to, uh, to emphasize his point that he is coming back to his friends. In these days, when a, a young man became betrothed to a young woman, he promised that he would marry her and come back to her, and then he left her, literally. He went away to his father's house to prepare a place for her so that when they get married, they would live there together. So Jesus, when Jesus says, I will not leave you, I'm coming back to you, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I will come and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. That is the imagery Jesus uses to emphasize his promise that he is coming back. And the second thing he promised was peace. Peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Now Jesus wouldn't have used the English word peace. Jesus would have used the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom. And shalom means an awful lot more than simply just peace. Shalom means completeness, wholeness, health, peace, welfare, <clears throat> safety, tranquility, perfection, fullness, rest, harmony, the absence of agitation or discord. No wonder Jesus said it's a peace this world cannot give, but it's his promise of peace to us. So when we think of George resting in peace, that is the peace in which he rests. Thanks be to God. Amen. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. Amen. We continue our worship now as we sing, the choir sing, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
Thank you. Let us pray. God of all grace, we thank you that in Jesus Christ you came to this earth to break the power of death and to bring life and immortality to light. Jesus shared our life, took upon himself our death so that we may share in his resurrection. Eternal God, we praise you for those who have shared this earthly life with us and have entered into eternal life with you. Especially we thank you for George, for all that made him special, for all that you gave him and accomplished in and through him, and all that he meant to those who knew and loved him. We remember with gratitude his kindness, his knowledge, his humour, his faith, his love. And we now thank you that for George, all pain and suffering are ended, that death itself is past. Help us to release him into your care and keeping, in the confidence that all life finds its fulfilment with you, in the joy of your eternal kingdom. We commend to you, you those who will miss George most in the days to come because they loved him best, especially his wife Brenda and his children, his son Jeremy and Lisa, his daughter Wendy and Al, his son Nigel and Christine and granddaughter Orla. Grant them that casting every care on you, they may know the comfort of your love. God of all comfort, in the midst of pain, heal us with your love. In the darkness of sorrow, shine upon us as the morning star. Awaken in us the spirit of mercy, that as we feel the pain of others, we may share with them the comfort we receive from you. And bring us at the last with all your people into the kingdom of your glory, where death itself is ended and every tear is wiped from every eye. In Jesus' name, amen. We say together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just before the choir sing our final hymn, I would just mention again that if you could remain seated after the service until the stewards uh, indicate you may leave, uh, there is some refreshments, I believe, in the church hall. 
Uh, I think it might be a limited number, but your stewards will keep you right in that one. Um, after the next hymn, before the blessing, uh, I'm going to ask one of our church members, Morvid Rees, she's going to sing one of George's favourite songs, Stevie Wonder's I Just Called to Say I Love You. So let us hear the choir sing our final hymn, The Day Thou Gavest, The Lord Is Ended. Thank you. Now I invite Morvin Ray to come forward. Morvin. Hello. <laughs> um, I believe this was one of George's favourite songs, so I was uh, honoured to be asked to sing it today. Unfortunately, as you might hear in my voice, um, this poison has developed a cold. <laughs> so I will do my best <laughs> and um, I hope you enjoy it and I hope George is hearing it. No New Year's Day to celebrate no chocolate covered candy hearts to give away. No first of spring, no song to sing. In fact, he's just another ordinary day. No April rain, no flowers bloom. Saturday within the month of June 
just called to say I love you. I just called to say how much I care. I just called to say I love you, and I mean it from the bottom of my. No summer's high, no warm July, no harvest moon to light one tender August sky, no autumn breeze, no fallen leaves, not even time for birds to fly to southern skies. No Libra sun, no Halloween, no giving thanks to all the Christmas joy you bring. But what it is, though old, so new, to fill your heart with these three words I say to you. Just get to play something. The blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Family to follow. Yeah.